Hello and welcome to week 4 lectures. Next week, this week we'll extend some of the material from last week and take a look at some influence for population proportions. So this is what this week's all about, about influence for population proportions. There are three things we'll do here. First of all, we'll take a look at some basic hypothesis testing for proportions and then we'll take a look at some more advanced material on the sampling distribution of the sample proportion and finally we will then further look at estimation of proportions using confidence intervals. So, here are some examples to motivate us. The first is that a coin is tossed 20 times and results in 13 heads. The question is, is this coin fair? And so, if I get 13, 13 heads from 20 tosses of the coin, then my probability of heads or proportion of heads here is 13 on 20, which is 0.65. Is this far away from 0.5 for me to be able to conclude the coin is unfair? Another example, a marketing campaign launched with the aim of increasing market share for calls, which actually stands at 28% at the moment. This is the real data. If we actually run the campaign and after the campaign we survey a thousand shoppers and ask them, ask them who they shop with, Coles or some other supermarket. And in there, if we get 350 of them saying they're Coles customers, that means my sample or observed proportion of Coles shoppers is 0.35 or 35%. Does that mean that the marketing campaign has increased the market share of Coles? The last one here is last summer Telstra shares was 40% of the market and another survey this summer showed that 500 out of the, the, another survey of 500 people showed 190 were with Telstra that gives 38% from the sample does that mean that the share has actually gone down these are the questions or types of questions we'll be looking at Here's another example here, personal thought. Now, according to the ABS, 11% of Australians aged 15 or more have experienced some kind of personal fraud in the year 2020-21. The rate in 2014-15 was 8.5%. Does that mean there has been an increase in personal fraud from 2014-15 to 2021? Observations here that all these questions deal essentially with a binomial probability based on data and we want to assess the probability based on data. This falls under what we call inference. Whenever we look at parameters for models and try and make some assessments on that, this falls under inference. Now the method commonly used for this particular type of problem depends on sample size here. In other words, the value of n our sample size. Let's have a look at this. So we're looking at what's called hypothesis tests for binomial probability here. And so the steps we're going to follow here will be using the coin tossing problem here. We've tossed a coin 20 times and we've observed 13 heads. Is the coin biased in favor of heads? So the first step here is requiring a probability model here. The question was all about tossing a coin 20 times and obtaining 13 heads, and then concluding if the coin was biased or not towards heads. But we require a probability model for that. This is just to quantify things. So here, a probability model is nothing more than a mathematical description of the random phenomena that mimics reality. And in this case, what we have is, if I let a random variable x denote the number of heads in 20 tosses, then x is binomial 20 p, p here. Now the p here denotes the probability of heads which is unknown to me because the idea here is I want, I want to decide if the coin is fair or not. If the coin is fair, p is 0.5. I don't know that yet. I'm going to assess the value of p in this case. Now p here is what we call a population parameter. Its value is unknown. So inference always deals with population parameters. The next step is to state the hypotheses that are being tested here, that it will be tested. And the question is, we want to see whether 
the point is biased or not. We don't start off by assuming the point is biased. We take what's called a neutral or null position. And the null position is essentially one that says the current belief or belief of no change. So I'm going to start off by assuming the co that the coin is not biased in favor of heads. So that the coin is fair. In other words, my H0 says, null hypothesis H0 says, that P is 0.5. This is what I am assuming the value of the probability of heads to be under the null hypothesis. In other words, I'm starting off, starting off to assume the coin is fair. Now, the alternative hypothesis actually is what I'm actually trying to test for, if you like. I'm actually trying to test here if the coin is unfair or biased towards heads. If the coin is biased towards heads, then what should the value of P be? Well, if it's biased towards heads, the probability of heads is going to be bigger than 0.5. That's how this works. So I start off by stating the null situation, which is one of no change. P is 0.5, in other words, the coin is fair. <laughs> And then I look at the alternative hypothesis. This is my suspicion that the coin is unfair and biased towards heads. So P is bigger than 0.5. Next idea is p-value. So how do I decide this question? Well, simply, simply by looking at 13 heads is not enough because you might think 13 is too many. I might think it's not enough. We need to quantify this in some way. So what we're going to work, is, work out is we're going to quantify this on the basis of probabilities. So I want to work out the probability of getting 13 heads in 20 tosses of a coin assuming or given the coin is fair and that comes from r 3.0739 this is why you call a p-value here in other words i'm assessing a probability here based on observed data and assuming the null hypothesis to be true here to be true here question is is this probability large or small is this p-value i've actually worked out here large or small so this is what i call my p-value here now notice one thing here <coughs> so far. I've just looked at probability x equals 30. That's single observation. Now, so on the basis of this, whether this probability of the p-value is large or small, I can decide are we likely to get 13 heads if the point is really fair? From a fair point, am I likely to get 13 heads? Well, if you think 13 heads are too many for a fair coin, then anything more than 13 heads is also too many. And so I'll go back a slide here and rub this out. This isn't quite my p-value, just to make sure it's understood. That's not quite my p-value. My p-value actually is going to be a statement that looks like this. Probability of x bigger than or equal to 13. What I observed, and more extreme than that. Assuming null hypothesis. Now what you notice here is I've got x bigger than or equal to 13. My h1 value was p bigger than 0 0.5. You'll find always that in this direction here and this direction here will be the same. So that's one way of making sure you're going in the right direction. I can work it out from, from R here. So probability of x bigger than or equal to 13 given p is 0.5 is 1 minus probability of x less than or equal to 12 given p is 0.5. There's my R value and I'm getting 0.1316. The decision here is that if the p-value is small, then the data is inconsistent with the null hypothesis. What I observe and the null hypothesis aren't consistent. Then either the coin is not fair, or the data is unusual and I've got a rare event. So in hypothesis testing, we ignore or discount the occurrence of rare events. So if the p-value is small, I would then conclude then the coin is biased in favor of heads. In this case, though, the p-value is small or not needs to be decided by some way. And what we do is we determine that by this preset significance level. Now, usually it's 5% or 0 0.05, and I'll stick with that for the moment. So I compare my p-value with this significance level of 0 0.05. It's bigger than that. That means I'll conclude that since p-value is bigger than 0 0.05, there is insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, I can conclude there is no evidence that the coin is biased. So the coin in this case, I would conclude, is not biased in this sphere. All right, now that's one example we've just done here. And just before we move on to the next part of this lecture, the main thing here to write conclusions to hypothesis test is 
it must be written in terms of the question of interest. You can't just say, I reject or, or, or not reject the null hypothesis. You must write it back in terms of the, the actual question. So answer the question of interest, be unambiguous, be impossible to misinterpret, and it must be the language of the context of discipline and subject. It must be concise. You don't require to write a whole essay on this. It must be concise, usually in a few lines. That's enough for this one. We'll take it up from the next lecture. Thanks. Bye.